Well, good morning. It is uh, good to be back at it, right? I mean, it is time. There's something about these uh, Sundays right after Labor, Labor Day. We're all kind of all in. I mean, football's back, and I, I get to read the scores and see what kind of mood you're going to be in. Uh, you know, I, that, that's good. And, and I got my sympathy calls about the Atlanta-Philadelphia game. Thanks for that. And, and know that, you know, we're learning to embrace the hometown team. It's good, right? Uh, but fall around here, of course, means it's, it's, it's back to the kids' programming and one Sunday training and uh, the new member class is going on right now. Lots of exciting things. And for me, uh, today is exciting because we're launching in this, this new sermon series, and, and I, I pray about those sermon series, and as I prayed and, and thinking about, especially this first one, um, in perhaps the most strategic year of the history of our church, what was that going to be? And I kept coming back to grace. You remember back in April on Easter Sunday, we decided that our name was going to be Grace Church Bethlehem. And we were looking for this, the, the right name. We, we looked at many, many names. And we were looking for this name that would kind of link us to our, our roots of Presbyterian and Reformed tradition and, and link us to our 140-year history, but also move us into our future. And we landed on Grace. So I thought there was no better way than to spend the next three weeks thinking about grace. And so this sermon series is called Getting What You Don't Deserve. That's grace. That's grace. Now, it's interesting. Um, many people think that grace is this brand new idea when Jesus came and the New Testament was starting to be written. Well, it's just not true. In fact, if you read the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the heart of both of those is grace. From the very beginning, God is a God who gives people what they don't deserve. You know, from the beginning, uh, way back in Exodus, God actually named himself gracious and compassionate. Isn't that interesting? From the very beginning, that's who God defined himself as. Even as you flip through the, the pages of the Old Testament, uh, and people keep straying from God and disobeying God and doing the things he doesn't want them, want them to do, God still extends grace. It's just who he is. A couple weeks ago, Legacy Sunday, Connie did this benediction that's straight out of the Old Testament, and it, it's actually the words of Aaron, the priestly benediction. Maybe you remember it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be, what do you know? Gracious. Right, unto you. It was grace that allowed God to come up with this idea of sacrifice in the Old Testament so people could find their way back to God. But grace really took on a new name when Jesus showed up. See, it was the way now that God wanted people to find their way back to him. Jesus, John says, was full of grace and truth. And Jesus gave us what we don't deserve. He died for us. He went to the cross for us so that we could get back to God. Jesus came to literally be the embodiment of grace. Grace is really at the heart of God's word. So grace is not only a good name for our church, it is that, it's not only a, a, a good sermon series, it's not only just that it's in the Bible all the time, grace is so amazing because grace is life-changing. One of my former churches, one day, I'll never forget it, I, I got a phone call and the person on the other line was absolutely inconsolable. I could barely understand what uh, this person was saying to me, and uh, I said, well, hey, come, come, come talk to me. So the next day, she came in, and, and, and she, she, she again couldn't talk to us. She couldn't talk to me. Finally, between sobs, she, she, she told me what was going on in her life, and she was devastated. She had made this really bad decision, and it was bad. There was a mess to clean up, and there were consequences, but there was also grace. 
See, she was sorry, and, 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 and she knew the steps that she needed to take, but what she couldn't believe was that God would forgive her. She couldn't believe that Jesus came for her and Jesus died for her so she could be forgiven, so she could come back to God. See, the hardest thing was how she was going to forgive herself because God had already forgiven her. A few months later, she was still discovering grace. And she brought me this gift, and I, I've never forgotten it, and it sits in my office at home. It's this beautiful needlepoint picture and this acronym for grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Hey, say that with me. Ready? God's riches at Christ's expense. She, she was beginning to understand that God loved her all the way to the cross so she could have forgiveness for her sins. And she could have blessing in her brokenness. And she could have purpose for her life. See, it was because of grace that she had this relationship with Jesus that changed everything. So today, as we start this sermon series, it's kind of like this week, Grace 101. What do you need to know about grace? Well, one of those straightforward things we can know about grace is comes straight from the book of Ephesians, and, and it's the scripture verse. In fact, let's read it together, would you? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, Paul wrote this. And Paul is the example. He was this guy who was shaped and saved by God's grace. If you remember his story, he was this man who had literally been terrorizing and killing Christians. And because he came smack dab into God's grace, he changed. And he became the strategic leader of the early Christian church. I mean, Paul knew about grace. And Paul knew where grace started, and that's the first thing we've got to know about grace, is that grace, my friends, is all God. As Paul wrote, there is nothing you can do. It is a gift. Now, we've talked before how Christianity is different from every other world religion. Now, every other world religion, you have to earn your relationship with God. You've got to work for your relationship with God. You've got to find it. You've got to make this relationship with God happen. But not Christianity, not Jesus. See, Jesus gives us the grace. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. He does for you what you can't do for yourself. Now it's interesting, so many people miss this. And oftentimes it's because people have a self-esteem problem. Now, some of us have a way too high view of ourselves. And we think, well, I'm really too good for grace. I don't need it, it's unnecessary in my life, I'm really just fine all by myself. You know, I read about an interview with Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York City, and, and in this interview, he was 72 at the time, and he was getting ready to go to his 50th college uh, reunion, and he was talking about how sobering it was that so many people had already died. Now, but Bloomberg, as he thought about his own death, he wasn't really worried. He started talking about his... Uh, work on gun safety and on obesity and smoking laws. And, and he said this in an interview with a smile on his face. Here's what he said. He said, I'm telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in. I've earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. Now, other people have a different kind of self-esteem problem 
And that's that they have this really, really low view of themselves. Some of us can't imagine that God would give us anything. We don't want to get anywhere close to God, not, uh, because our life is a mess, and we know that God's not going to deal with things that are this messy as us. Back in the 20th century, there was this um, competition that a newspaper ran, and uh, people were invited to give responses to this question. What's wrong with the world? Well, a lot of responses came in, but one became famous, and it was written by a a famous English writer by the name of G.K. Chesterton. Here's what he wrote. He said, Dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world? G.K. Chesterton knew that he was. See, if you understand grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, this is your attitude. You know you don't deserve it, but that's the point. You also know that it doesn't depend on you. It's all God. See, you don't deserve it, but God gives it anyway. It's who God is. It always has been. God loves you. God pursues you. He will do absolutely anything to have this relationship with you. Grace is all about God. But you cannot fully grasp God. You cannot fully get grace until you understand how desperately you need it. See, all you need is this, this, this desire to receive grace, and God gives it. But you gotta know you need it. You gotta know that you can't live up to even your own standards. You gotta know that there's no reason to put your fi- point your finger at other people, because there are four other fingers looking back at you. Here's the truth. God is that good, and you are that bad. Now, if you're thinking, well, uh, I'm not that bad, then you're never going to experience how good grace really is. Because to embrace grace, you have to get honest about your life. And that's the next thing you need to know about grace. Grace is all about God, but grace is also so personal. You know, this week, the world can't get enough of this moment that that changed a girl's life. Her dreams came true when she got exactly what she needed and exactly what she dreamed for. It was a gift that she couldn't get on her own. Here it is. All right, well, there's one more gift. It's not for Grammy, but it's... Yeah, it's another gift. Why don't you careful open it up? There we go. I want you to read it. I'm going to be adopted. <laughs> we love you, sweetheart. We'll always be your parents. I love you so. seen that video a bunch of times. Yeah, go ahead. So awesome. And there's something that touches me so deeply. 
thinking that someone knows what's deepest in the heart of someone and, and there was a gift given. But friends, that's what God does with grace. See, Jesus knows exactly what you need. And he moves in your life and he gives it to you. Grace is so personal. Jesus comes after you and he, he has this gift of grace just for you. You know, if you read the New Testament, you see Jesus doing this over and over again. Jesus is always doling out grace when he meets people. One day Jesus met this, this woman at the well and it was the middle of the day. No one else was there. She was the wrong kind of woman who, who was there at the, the wrong time of day, if you know what I mean. And Jesus was about to make her life right. Here's what happened. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had, had gone away in, into town um, to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you... A Jew ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and, and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. Jesus asked this woman for a drink, but he knew that he was the one who's really going to give the gift. See, Jesus had grace. He knew this woman was thirsty for something she couldn't even figure out. Her first marriage didn't give her what she wanted. And her second one, and her third one, she thought that those things were going to make her life better. And then Jesus walked in. And Jesus told her the truth. He told her the truth about this mess that was her life. But then he gave her a gift. He gave her grace. You know, if you were to meet Jesus at the well and nobody else was there, what would Jesus know about you? What would he see that nobody else can see? What hurt or pain, or brokenness, or sin? Would it be your anger? Or your slippery slope of, of boundaries at, at work? Or the person you're living with who you barely even talk to? Or your addiction with, uh, with porn or, or alcohol? or your debts, or your doubts, or your fears, or your, your failure, or your, your, your grief, or your shame, or maybe your anxiety that is absolutely paralyzing you. Well, I don't know what it is. 
but Jesus does. And your life and my life and the woman at the well's life have something in common. And please hear this if you hear nothing else from me today. There is nothing in your life that is greater than God's grace. Nothing. See, here's the way Paul said it. Read this with me. Even greater is God's grace. Read one more time. Even greater is God's grace. See, Jesus knew all about her life. He knew all about her serial relationships. He knew all about her shame. He knew all about her longings. And and Jesus could have just walked away from her. I mean, everybody else would have. But he didn't. Not Jesus. See, that's, that's grace. That day, she came face to face with grace. And she got what she didn't deserve. She got grace. See, Jesus invited her to see the truth in her life. And then he invited her into something so much better. See, here's what happened next. His disciples came back and and they marveled that Jesus was talking to a woman. The woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard it for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. See, grace changes people's lives. Grace doesn't just leave us alone. It takes us where we're supposed to be. See, grace changed this woman's life, but it it didn't even stop there. God used her life to change a whole town. He used a broken woman to get all kinds of other broken men and women to meet the grace of Jesus. And that brings me to one more thing, Grace 101. Grace works. See, God gives us grace so your life is changed. Many of you know uh, the story of the hymn, Amazing Grace. It might be the most loved hymn of all times. Uh, In fact, you don't even have to go to church to know the words and and, and the tune of Amazing Grace. You may know the song, but you, you may not know the story of the man who wrote it. His name was John Newton, and his life was a wreck. His mom died when he was seven years old, and his dad was this rough, tough Ship captain. And that's kind of the environment that John grew up in. He found alcohol early and he very quickly abandoned the faith that his mom had tried to give him before she died. He had no interest in God. And after getting kicked out of the Navy, he actually, through a turn of events, became a slave. And then through another turn of events, John Newton ended up as the captain of a slave ship. Spent his life capturing and selling people. He was about as far away from God as you can imagine. But then one day a storm hit. It was a, a physical storm, but it was also a storm of his soul. This, this storm almost killed him and the entire boat full of slaves. And on that day, John Newton relented. He gave his life to God. But if you read his story, it actually took a while to sink in. Even though John Newton wrote the words, amazing grace, it actually took a while for him to get it. It took years for the grace to break into his life. But eventually, John Newton 
the slave trader, became an abolitionist. The man who hated the Bible began to study the Bible. The man who ran from God ran to God's grace. That's the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. Here's the words on his tombstone. John Newton, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. Grace changes lives. See, Jesus never leaves you where you are, but he gives you this gift of grace and he invites you to what's new. Just a few minutes, we're going to take communion together and I want to give you a way to think about God's grace in your life. A few minutes to prepare your heart and to to pray and and, and get ready to receive the gift of communion. And um, to help you, I want you to hear Aretha Franklin sing Amazing Grace. Now, long before R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Oh, hang on. Stop it, stop it. Hang on. Close. You're getting a preview. Long before R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Aretha was singing gospel music. In fact, that recording and that album is the best-selling live album ever. Well, it was interesting. Aretha wanted um, to record that, but she didn't want to do it in a studio. So she uh, asked her producer, she said, I want to actually sing this in church. But it didn't stop there. She said, not only do I want to sing it in church, but it's going to feel weird if it's not a worship service. So I want to sing that amazing song as a part of a worship service. The pastor said it was just like any other worship service they ever had in that church. Of course, Aretha Franklin was a soloist, right? Well, her funeral, just a few weeks ago, many people mentioned this incredible recording. And someone said of her singing that day as she recorded Amazing Grace, they said of her, she was not the Aretha in lights that you see on the stage. She was just Aretha, our sister singing for the Lord. Now as we get ready to take communion, I invite you to hear this song. I invite you to experience and remember in your own life It's bigger than anything you have, friends. It's amazing.
I see. 